good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Chester Hashizume, and we are at the second session of our class. Uh, I want to introduce Florence Ochi, who will say a few brief words. Uh, she represents the Yamaguchi Kenjin Kai. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining in. And I hope you're learning something from the first meeting. As we go along into the second and third parts, I hope you uh, learn something about how to go about finding your family tree. So uh, thank you very much. And Chester, thank you for conducting this session. And Stephanie, thank you for being the uh, go-to person for Zoom. So let's get started. Chester? Thank you. So as a reminder, uh, if you have questions, uh, please type your questions in the chat. Um, and then uh, every once in a while, I'll pause to see if there's any questions and Stephanie will read them so everyone could hear. Uh, also, if you just have any comments on your own experience or uh, have a uh, comment on someone else's question, feel free to, to also put that in the chat uh, because uh, uh, again, everything that I provide is, is based on my own experience. It's not necessarily uh, the same for everybody. You know, what I give is, uh, could be a, a general answer and someone else may have had a different experience. So uh, again, this is, uh, something uh, that everyone can share in from their own experiences. And uh, uh, again, feel free to, to contribute on what, whatever you've discovered. So with that, I will start off with uh, the next part of uh, my own journey. And I just wanted to convey uh, what I went through, and it's not necessarily what uh, you will encounter, and uh, because again, everyone will have a, a different uh, access to information, and uh, uh, you know what type of information they'll be able to find. So this week, I'm going to talk about my father's side of the family, and what the map represents is that. Uh, my uh, grandparents uh, came from uh, this uh, part of Japan, which is Ishikawa Prefecture, and they immigrated to southern New Jersey in the Atlantic City area. So uh, uh, that's much different than uh, most of the West Coast uh, Japanese Americans. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of Japanese Americans don't even realize that there were uh, Japanese who immigrated to uh, this part of New Jersey. So uh, I'll show you what, uh, what I uh, grew up with. So uh, my father's parents lived in Atlantic City while I grew up. Uh, we lived uh, about 135 miles away, so we rarely saw them. And my father didn't talk too much about them, and I really didn't ask. And uh, when we visited them, I didn't uh, have much communication with them because uh, they spoke little English, and I, of course, didn't speak any Japanese. Uh, but I always enjoyed my visits uh, there because they had a uh, gift store uh, on the boardwalk, which had uh, a lot of these little Japanese uh, items that uh, that you know were unusual for uh, Americans. So uh, you know they always let us uh, get one of those items, and you know they had other things like the the rice candy. So, uh, you know, those are uh, my memories of uh, visiting uh, my father's parents. And then after my grandfather passed away, uh, my grandmother moved in to our house. 
So when my father passed away in 1988, we wanted to notify uh, his relatives in Japan. However, we didn't really know where they were. So we had some old letters uh, that were written in the 50s uh, that had been sent to my grandfather and it had the return address. So I show the uh, actual image of uh, that letter. And um, so my mother who could uh, read, write and speak Japanese, uh, she uh, decided to write a letter to this address, even though it was more than 30 years old. Uh, and then this person, uh, Kuromoto, we didn't know exactly who he was, but uh, you know, we, we wrote to uh, that address. Uh, and as you can see, it's in uh, a town called Terai. So surprisingly, we got a reply back from a, um, a first cousin of my father's once removed. And then, uh, you know, because at that time in 1980, I was just beginning to uh, become interested in my family tree. So uh, I encouraged my mother to continue the correspondence and you know, find out more about our family. So we asked uh, the relative who wrote us back to uh, send us the family tree. So this is what he sent and my mother uh, translated it. And he always encouraged us to visit him in Tarai. So uh, this is the location. Uh, as I mentioned, it's in Ishikawa prefecture, which is on the uh, Sea of Japan side. Uh, and again, most of the Japanese immigrants from the late 1800s came from southwestern Japan, you know, this area and further uh, south. So like Wakayama, Okayama, that, that area, uh, Yamaguchi Ken. So uh, not too many Japanese came from this part of Japan. And uh, this is the uh, uh, town uh, logo and uh, symbol. And uh, as people might guess, it's a, uh, a ceramic. And I'll get into why that is. So I decided to visit my father's side of the family. Um, yeah, I visited my mother's side uh, in my previous uh, visit uh, that I showed last week. And um, yeah, at that time, my uh, mother had passed away. So uh, previously, you know, I was able to take advantage of her language skills. So, you know, she interpreted uh, everything on my first trip, but this time, uh, you know, after she had passed away, there was no one who could really help out uh, in our family. Uh, but I decided to go anyway because I had put off the trip for, for, for so long, you know, just because you know, I wasn't able to uh, speak Japanese. So what I did was I wrote a letter uh, to the relatives you know, that my mother had previously corresponded with. Uh, I had a friend who translated it. Uh, and then I had another friend uh, in Japan who could find out their phone number and um, and give me their phone number. So uh, before I uh, went to Japan, I called them up and I had my uh, another friend who was uh, bilingual. He uh, interpreted as I, you know, explained what what I was planning to do and giving them the dates of, you know, when I plan to visit them and well, uh, initially to, to sort of ask them if I could stay at their house. And I remember when I uh, uh, mentioned that to, you know, through, through my friend, you know, his interpretation, you know, that I 
planned to stay for five days. Uh, there was a long pause at the other end. And so uh, I, I guess they were sort of uh, surprised by my request. So anyway, I, uh, what I did to help with the uh, interpretation uh, I, I mentioned this last week is I looked up this uh, Goodwill Guide, which is a volunteer group out of the uh, JNTO, the Japan National Tourist Organization, uh, uh, who was of course bilingual, who could help with the introductions. So my father uh, had previously visited uh, his his father's uh, hometown uh, during the occupation of Japan because he was uh, in the army and uh, he uh, volunteered or got assigned to uh, be in Japan. So this is a picture of him with uh, our relatives. Uh, he's the one, of course, uh, in the middle with the army uniform and then the, our relative who we were corresponding with uh, after he had passed away is this other uh, gentleman holding a baby uh, to, uh, to my father's left. So this is the picture I took uh, when we visited in 2000 on the left and then on the right side is, uh, is a picture of him uh, previously. So actually, even though he was um, a cousin once removed, um, he was about the same age as my father. And then his daughter here, uh, and I show her picture uh, when I uh, met them in 2000, she was approximately my age. So, you know, that made it uh, kind of interesting for us uh, to meet, you know, that we were about the same age. So these are uh, my relatives sitting. Uh, this is the first night that we uh, met. Um, and then uh, some of these uh, other people are actually Kuramoto. And I'll uh, explain that, why they're related. So this is what I found out from, you know, about my grandparents uh, during my discussions with my relatives. And again, this was through the interpreter. So my grandfather came with his cousin in the early 1900s to trade in lacquerware and Kutani ceramics, which was the uh, type of ceramic that uh, was created in uh, they're in this town of Tarai. So uh, you see the lower left here, cradle of Kutani. So apparently Tarai is famous for this ceramic. Uh, and you know, they were famous from several hundred years ago. And the reason they also dealt with lack of wear was because uh, this was a, uh, a product that was produced in uh, a nearby uh, city or the peninsula actually uh, of the uh, Ishikawa prefecture called Wajima. So they're famous for their, uh, their lacquerware. So uh, these two items, uh, apparently um, my, my grandfather and his cousin uh, wanted to start a trade with with the West. And then my grandmother, I found out, was a school teacher uh, from a family. Uh, her maiden name was Kajitani uh, with samurai roots. So, uh, you know, on both instances, you know, both her profession and her background were considered very prestigious in Japan. And then, as I mentioned about uh, Wajima. So there was a chronology written, uh, which they gave to me, uh, which talked about my grandfather and his cousin's activities. 
uh, during the early 1900s to trade in lacquer and, uh, and the ceramics. So apparently they went to Europe because we see pictures, uh, a picture of England here, and then they looks like they traveled uh, throughout the United States. So um, here's some other information that I found out. Uh, oh, by the way, all the information that I got from my relatives in Japan, I, again, I did not get any of that from my father or my grandparents. I guess, as I mentioned, uh, they didn't tell me anything about uh, their background. Uh, uh, so there's some more information I was able to get from my grandfather uh, from the 1910 census, which uh, you can get from ancestry.com. So apparently he was uh, a boarder with some other Japanese in Atlantic City and he was under his American name, George. Uh, so here's other immigrations I found on my grandfather. So again, he apparently he came into this country several times. He was in the US uh, from 1904 to 1910. He re-entered through Buffalo. So apparently that was through Canada. You know, because Buffalo was on the border of the U.S. and Canada in 1912. And then on his final trip, he came in through uh, Seattle with his wife. So uh, yeah, I, I showed you the Seattle records, which I uh, had uh, last week. But uh, you know, at, at that time, I, I was unaware that he had actually made two other trips, which I again found in Ancestry.com. Uh, I also found his draft records. So what was uh, unusual is that he was actually drafted twice. Uh, once for World War I, where uh, he was in his 30s. So again, that was seemed kind of unusual to draft someone in their 30s. And he was a uh, a Japanese you know, citizen you know, at, at that time. So I didn't know that the draft applied to, to foreign nationals. And then again, in, uh, during World War II, when he was 59, he was drafted. So you know, that again was quite surprising, but you know, here it is. Yeah, and again, he was 59, so even more unusual. And again, he was still a Japanese citizen. So uh, this was the one uh, thing that I uh, learned from my father that uh, our ancestors ran a sweet store, confectionery store uh, in Terai. Uh, yeah, and that was the only thing we knew. So when uh, I went went there, uh, and I went with my brother and his kids, which you know, showing in the lower left, uh, we were anxious to see whether the store was still around. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't. But you know, I I have a picture here of what it looked like uh, back then, and uh, yeah, I would imagine that they made you know, things like mochi. Um, but uh, apparently, and this is what our relatives told us, that the, they sold off the business and then the location where the store was, uh, there is now a camera store. So that's, that's why we took the picture in front of that uh, camera store. So my current relatives who uh, are living in Tanai, and again, uh, this goes back to what I had mentioned last week that uh, where you have a great probability that you have uh, relatives still living in that same town where your ancestors came from. So again, this is in Tanai where my grandfather came from.
so my current relatives, they have a milk delivery business. So uh, for some of you who are older, uh, there you might recall that you know in the U.S. they had door-to-door uh, -door, you know fresh milk delivery. Uh, you know I grew up in New Jersey and you know that that is uh, you know was an agricultural uh, area and I remember uh, sorry I remember that uh, we did have milk delivered uh, you know daily I believe and so. You know, at this time, and this was 2000, that they, you know, still did that. You know, because this was still a small town. So I, I'm showing their. They had all these minivans which they loaded up every morning, and uh, you know, with uh, all these milk products. So uh, in Japan, they have, you know, more than just plain, you know, whole milk. They have all these uh, flavored milks and yogurts and things like that. So. Uh, that's why you see all this variety of uh, uh, products. So, sorry, this is sort of jumping here. So when my brother and I were there, we said, oh, well, can we come along with you on your milk delivery uh, uh, work? And they said, sure, but you know, you'll have to wake up at like four in the morning. So, so that's what we did. And yeah, you know, we helped them load up. And then, you know, they drove us around. They had like uh, two or three vans. And uh, so, you know, it was my, um, you know, this is the daughter that I showed you before. And this is her husband, I believe. So, you know, it's like a family business. And then their daughter also was uh, helping out. You know, she was, I believe in college. So, you know, when he, she was home, you know, this was in August, when she was home for the summer, she would help out as well. So, uh, so we helped uh, deliver the milk uh, that morning. So it was quite uh, interesting experience. Uh, it was quite strenuous because, uh, you know, they're, they want to get it done as quickly as possible. So, you know, like I went with uh, uh, my uh, uh, this relative here, the the uh, wife, and uh, you know she would make a stop and then just point to the bottles that I should deliver, and you know I, I had to sort of run run to the door, pick up the the empty bottles, and then put in the the uh, fresh milk. So now we get into uh, the meaning of my family name. So this is the kanji, uh, how it's written. So the, the first character is Hashi, uh, which is bridge. And the second uh, is Zume or Tsume, which means uh, a fingernail or claw. Uh, However, the, the actual meaning, according to my relative, it means at the end of the bridge. So, uh, and this is actually a picture of that bridge. So the story is that uh, the original family that took on this name uh, was a Kuramoto and a Minami. And you know, I mentioned previously that uh, you, you saw the letter had, you know, it was from a Kuramoto and that there were some Kuramotos in that uh, uh, picture where we we're uh, uh, eating. So uh, that's why the Kuramoto are in my family tree. However, when they got together, they decided to take on a new name. And uh, again, this is what my relative told me that their house happened to be at the end of this bridge. And so they decided to call themselves Hashizume. So it's kind of a, not a very you know, complex story, but that's uh, apparently how uh, I got my family name. And you know, when I talk about 
uh, the origin of names later on. Uh, you know, I'll explain the different ways that people were able to uh, take on their names. And then uh, it's the 1262nd most common name in Japan. Uh, I think that's sort of changed. And you know, when I get into names, I'll, I'll get into that. But uh, you might think, well, that's not very common, but uh, there's over 100,000 names in Japan. So you know, someone might say, well, that seems to be somewhat common then. And of course it's not, <laughs> Not very common at all in in the United States. Although uh, uh, there are some other families with uh, Hashizume. Uh, this is our family crest, um, and again, I got I had to get it from my relative. It is a Tachibana, which is a uh, Mandarin orange. Uh, it was taken from the Minami family, so uh, this was the uh, first, quote, first wife. Uh, I asked why they took it from the Minami side rather than the Kuramoto side, and they, they said, well, the Minami family was more prestigious, so I guess that's, that's why they took it. Uh, and then this is just some information I found in a book about this particular uh, crest design. So, uh, as uh, when I go into the family crest, uh, I'll explain why uh, people can have the same family crest, but but not be, you know, not have the same family name, nor even be related. So, you know, I mentioned before about how there's a consolidation of municipalities. So uh, Terai, I found out after my trip, uh, it was merged into this Nomi city in 2005. So anyway, again, here's some more pictures, uh, past and, and present at the time I went of uh, my relatives. So let me switch back here. So, are there any questions at this point? Uh, no questions yet. Okay. So, um, this is where I left off last week about uh, records that people can access to find out their family uh, hometown. So, in 1940, there was a law passed called the Alien Registration Act, which required uh, registration of uh, resident aliens and this was targeting the uh, the Japanese um, in particular and so uh, and I'll show a, a sample of that record but uh, uh, these were you know collected uh, I probably by the uh, uh, Justice Department or, or one of those, but anyway, they're they're now kept by uh, U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services or the National Archives, and I put the uh, links on how you could access them. And I included a form in your reference section. Uh, it may be out of date. Uh, you'll have to check the website to see whether that's still the current form, but you can. Uh, request uh, these records. So here's a sample. This is not uh, of my uh, grandfather. This was someone else's, uh, but they had requested. So you can see the information that's available. Uh, if you look at the bottom, uh, it gives relatives and their address. So in this case, um, it did not give the town. I believe uh, Miyagi was, was just a prefecture that they were able to put down. So again, this may not be uh, useful from the point of view of getting the uh, 
town, specific town, but uh, again, th this is some more information which you know you may not have. You know, and of course the the relatives are part of the your family tree. So I wanted to go over this uh, consolidation um, uh, phenomenon. So if you're looking for the specific town name, you know, if you try to Google it, uh, you may not be able to find it because what has happened in the past uh, approximately 130 years, the government of Japan has uh, mandated that uh, all these little towns and villages be consolidated to have a more efficient local government. And this is the term uh, that is specifically used. So to give you a sense of what has happened. So in 1888, there were over 70,000 municipalities in Japan. By uh, 1945, there were only 10,000. And uh, by 2014, there were only 1,700. And that's approximately uh, about the same today. And uh, you, know, you can look up the more, more recent um, changes at this website. Uh, so as you can see, there's been like a 90% reduction in the number of uh, municipalities. So it's, there's probably a, a, a very good chance that the town that your ancestors came from is no longer an independent municipality, that it's part of you know, one of these 1700. So, uh, so you have to uh, research that to find out uh, you know, exactly which municipality it's a part of. And, uh, you know, you can look on the internet and, uh, and find that information for the most part. So uh, what I did, you know, it's, I, I didn't have all this uh, Wikipedia stuff at the time when I, when I was looking up uh, my uh, maternal grandmother's birthplace, as I mentioned last week, about uh, uh, Yawata, and uh, what I did was uh, I found a website uh, by the uh, Hiroshima Prefectural Government Tourist and Exchange Division. They had an English website. So I just uh, sent an email to them asking them about uh, Iwata, what happened to it. And they replied uh, that it had emerged with, with Kisa in the 1950s. So that's uh, actually how I found out about this uh, uh, merger phenomenon uh, that it's happening uh, throughout Japan. And again, it will probably affect uh, all of our uh, uh, hometowns and you know, trying to find a name for it. So the other thing to note is that um, the administrative divisions that is you know today it's prefecture uh, have also changed in the past 150 years so again if you're looking for information uh, you know from the 1800s or before uh, they had uh, they were divided into provinces and then um, afterwards when they sort of restructured everything into uh, prefectures. But again, that has also changed because initially uh, there were over 300 and now there's, there's only 47. So uh, here is a map of you know, all the uh, Japanese provinces. So uh, you, you, know, you may have documents that say that uh, your ancestors came from a certain province, and then you say, well, where the heck is that? Because that's, you know, that's not a, a current prefecture. So you, know, you would have to look into something like this to find out, okay, where, where are these provinces located? And then here's, a, here's where the current prefectures are located. So uh, 
the most of the again um, Japanese immigrants came from this area of Japan, the south part of Japan, Okayama, Hiroshima, Yamaguchi, etc. So, uh, you know, and then my father's uh, parents came from Ishikawa. You can see it's uh, further up here. So I wanted to get into a little bit about the Japanese family and household because this impacts uh, how the how you'll be viewing the family tree and the documents that are available for uh, that are in Japan. Uh, so until recently, the household or ie, not the individual, was the basic unit of society, and uh, you know even today. You know, it's uh, the whole um, society is oriented around family. Although, uh, you know, they've become more westernized, and you know, of course, individuals. But uh, you know, prior to the 1800s, you know, everything was family, even physically. You know, you would have three generations living in uh, a, the same household, and. Uh, everyone probably is familiar that, uh, you know, not only Japan, but probably most of the Asian societies uh, where the, it's a male uh, dominated uh, society, uh, the roles and hierarchy based on the gender, age, you know, again, you, you respect the elders, uh, and then kinship, meaning that you know, whether you are biologically uh, born, uh, you know, uh, in the family as opposed to, uh, you know, marrying into the family or being adopted. Uh, and then again, it's a patriarchal uh, family with the male uh, being the head of the family. Uh, and then the eldest son usually becomes the head of the family you know, everyone hears about the Chonan, and then they would take over the family business or farm. Uh, and then when the other sons, you know, if there were more than one son, when they moved out uh, to establish their own families, uh, these were sometimes referred to as, as branch households. And then daughters uh, would be married into other families. So they would become part of those other, you know, of their uh, husband's family. So because of this uh, uh, patriarchal society, uh, it, it was imperative that providing an heir, uh, a male heir. So if a family had no sons, the practice of quote adoption became very common and it's it's still a practice in modern times. Uh, it's less frequent because you know this idea of having a male heir is not as important today as it was you know back then but you know there, I, there are still families that uh, want their family name to be carried on. So uh, this could occur in several different situations. Uh, you know, if a family had no son, so one, if a family had daughters, uh, they would usually have her husband uh, take on the family name. So this uh, is sort of an adoption, it's not, the same as we view it in Western society, where you know you adopt uh, someone in you know when they're a child. Uh, so this is they become adopted when the daughter gets married. So this is uh, referred to as a mukoyoshi. And so again, this will probably be you will find this in your family tree somewhere uh, because it, it was fairly. Uh, common, and you know, I've I've seen several in my own family tree. 
Sorry about that. I clicked on this. And then if a family had no children, uh, there were you know, a couple different options. One, they could adopt a daughter or, and then preferably from, you know, some other relatives and who would later marry a Mukoyoshi or, uh, Yeah, that would, that would be the other case. So the mukuyoshi would be treated as if they were a biological uh, child of the adopted family, but they would lose their connection with their natural family. And I'll, I'll get into the implications of that in the records. So I'll pause here if there's any questions. Uh, no questions yet. Okay. So uh, this is the document that uh, you probably heard of the Koseki. So this is the household registry or family registry. And it's the official record of uh, the family, of you know, the births, the deaths, the marriages, divorces, adoptions, et cetera. So uh, it fulfills the role of, of these other items. So if you enter a person into the koseki, that essentially means that uh, you are, you exist in Japan and actually you are a Japanese citizen if you are on a koseki. So this, uh, was passed in 1871, so it's actually fairly recent. Um, and it became the legal document for uh, individual identification. And when I talk about names, I'll, I will explain why the Koseki uh, was the uh, biggest uh, uh, impact on uh, people's names. So as I mentioned, uh, the Koseki is the legal proof of status as a Japanese citizen. So the Koseki is maintained in the uh, municipality where the person lived. So that's, uh, that was a primary reason for identifying that town because that's where the Koseki would be kept. Uh, and then the, uh, a duplicate is, is sent to the regional Ministry of Justice, so probably the prefectural government. Uh, so everyone needs to report changes. Uh, so if they're not recorded, they're not officially acknowledged by the Japanese government. And so, uh, again, a, another implication of this is that uh, many uh, Nisei were recorded on their uh, family's koseki, and they may not have even known that. So what does that mean? It means that the Nisei were actually dual citizens, because by being born in the United States, they became American citizens, but by recording their names in the koseki, they became uh, Japanese citizens as well. Uh, and then, you know, I don't believe you needed to be in person. They probably, you know, sent some document to, you know, the, the home government and, you know, let them know of, of uh, children being born. So, uh, if you need to get a copy of your koseki, they uh, are used for you know, identification for you know, some various other uh, transactions. So the structure of the koseki is based on the traditional family. Uh, so that's why I mentioned about the uh, family constructs and society at that time uh, where, you know, where there were multiple generations. 
So that's why the COSEC is not a document of a single person, it is of a family. So here's all the information uh, that you would find. And I'll show you, this is sort of a layout of what a uh, standard Koseki uh, content would be. So reading from right to left, you know, if it were in Japanese, uh, the domicile is the uh, address. And then you have the head of the household, you know, as I mentioned, you know, why you know, the, the Japanese society was uh, a patriarchal society. So you, you have a head of household, then uh, the name of the husband and wife and the children in chronological order. And then some additional information in, in the upper half of the document. So this is uh, an image of my father's uh, family Koseki. So I have not got this translated yet, but uh, I, I, I think I have most of the information, but uh, I'll, I'll have to, I'm not quite sure exactly what, uh, what all these names are. So if you notice these X's here, uh, what that means is um, that names are uh, expired or removed. So what that means could, could be one of several things. One, uh, the person has passed away uh, or they're entered in another Koseki so in the case of a marriage, so, you know, most cases it's the daughter uh, that, you know, when they get married, their name will get crossed off their uh, biological family's koseki, and then it will get added to their, uh, her husband's family koseki. But in the case of the uh, Yoshi, where the husband comes into the family, you know, the same thing happens except you know the husband's uh his uh, uh biological family's koseki he would be xed out and then divorces they would uh you know take off the, the divorced you know non-biological person's name off of that uh and then as i just mentioned if you become a yoshi so when all the names are crossed off in a koseki, uh, it becomes, uh, it gets archived. And so that's referred to as the uh, joseki, joseki bowl. So these are the documents that you will want to get. So the koseki is of the current uh, people living you know, it may include some who have passed away, but uh, it would have all the ones who are currently living. And then the Joseki would have uh, everyone who's either passed away or, or transferred to some other Koseki. So, um, so this is a step-by-step -step procedure on how to request a copy and I'll have to caveat this by saying that uh, there's uh, very strict rules about uh, providing copies of the Koseki because of the uh, privacy laws in Japan, but I'll, I'll just go over sort of the generic process. Uh, so, of course, you have to determine the the hometown of the village, uh, the hometown of the, your ancestor. Uh, and then uh, again, you may not have all this information, you probably don't. Uh, they need to know wh where they lived, you know, it's the address, which you probably wouldn't know. Uh, you need to determine the present jurisdiction, that is the, which municipality they're in now, you know, as I mentioned, it's uh, very likely that it has been merged into some other city. 
and then you'll have to find out where they're located. Uh, write up the formal request, uh, preferably in Japanese. Of course, that's another uh, issue. Then there's some fees involved, you know, because it's a government uh, request. And then the, uh, the last part is probably the most difficult is you have to show proof that you're related to the person. So generally, uh, you're only allowed to request a copy of a koseki if you are uh, named in that koseki or if it's you know, for a uh, ancestor or relative, you will need to show you know, proof that you're related to that person. Again, this is a privacy requirement you know, because they don't want just anyone to get copies of someone else's uh, family registry. Uh, so, you know, I, I mentioned some of the documentation and information that uh, they're going to require, uh, which probably in most cases you would not have. Uh, I mentioned that you might be able to provide some other documentation uh, that may be acceptable, uh, but uh, I've been speaking with uh, a lawyer who, you know, in Japan who has, uh, who does this for a living, getting uh, other people's uh, koseki and choseki and, uh, he says, uh, this probably won't work, what I'm explaining, uh, because of the uh, strictness of what documentation is required in Japan. So, uh, so what I'm telling you probably doesn't work based on what, uh, what an expert has told me. And uh, again, I haven't actually done this myself. Uh, and have not encountered anyone uh, personally who, who has able, been able to get it themselves. Oh, Chester? Yes. We have one question. Um, someone's asking, do daughters' married names appear on, I think, their husband's koseki, so to follow their family name where she went? You mean uh, her, uh, can you uh, repeat the I question? I think she's asking, does the, the daughter's married name, so when she marries somebody, does her maiden name follow her onto his koseki? No, she, she will take on her uh, husband's family name. Okay. Because uh, I believe the rule is that everyone on a koseki on a family koseki, uh, must have the same uh, family name. So, uh, you know, wh whatever the rules are about marriage, you know, about, see, I'm not that familiar with that, but, you know, whether um, women can retain their maiden name, like, you know, like in the United States, you know, as their legal name, uh, but, what I've read in Japan, the koseki at least, requires that everyone have the same family name who is on the koseki. And that's, that's the reason why when someone gets married, they're supposed to uh, take on the uh, family name. And you know, likewise for the Yoshi. Mm -hmm. And then there's a follow-up question too. She's asking, will her family, will her maiden, family's name tell whom she married? I believe uh, that can be traced in her uh, biological uh, family koseki. So in other words, when, when her name gets X'd out, I believe there would be uh, comments you know, in that upper section about uh, who she married and, you know, and that's how you 
uh, would be able to trace to you know the uh, their husband's family Koseki. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so this is just sort of a, a summary of the difficulties in um, getting a copy of the Koseki or Joseki, uh, mainly because of the privacy concerns. Uh, and then, you know, all the additional challenges that we face as Japanese Americans of, you know, even getting the information, you know, where to write to, uh, who the names are, what the address is, etc. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that um, make it, you know, uh, very difficult to uh, do this on your own. And then on top of that, you know, not to, you know, discourage a lot of people, but, uh, you know, the, the Joseki is only going back to the 1880s because that's when the law was passed. So, you know, that's the time of, you know, the Issei. So, you know, it would be whoever was living at that time. So, you know, it may go back, you know, two further generations, but, you know, that's all. So if you're thinking that, oh, you know, can I go back to, you know, the 1600s? Uh, no, because the records only started in the 1880s. And, uh, and then the other thing is, uh, I had read that they were being destroyed because, you know, they were on paper. Uh, and I don't know whether they're preserving it either through microfilm or digitizing. Uh, I would hope that they're preserving it in some manner, but I uh, don't have uh, any information about uh, whether they are or not. And uh, yeah, because they were on paper, they didn't, you know, the, the governments wanted to, you know, have more space, so they um, uh, destroyed uh, a lot of the records. Uh, other difficulties, so, the information may be difficult to read because the kanji has changed. And in particular, names are in general difficult to read because they can be read in different ways. And I'll get into that when I talk about names. Uh, so people ask, you know, how about records that were destroyed during World War II because of the Allied bombing. So generally only the major industrial cities were bombed. So yes, probably the records for these cities, you know, were destroyed or a lot of them. However, because, you know, by far most of our ancestors came from these small towns and villages, they were not bombed. So therefore their records should, should still be around, you know, if they weren't, you know, destroyed by the government uh, because of the uh, uh, lack of space. Uh, so that would, should not be a concern to most of us. However, uh, apparently in Okinawa, there were a lot of records that were destroyed, uh, either intentionally, you know, because I understand that a lot of the Okinawans, when uh, the Allies uh, defeated the Japanese. They were uh, afraid of uh, you know, things being taken, uh, or even by the Japanese themselves, because you know the Okinawans were uh, actually not considered full Japanese. Uh, so they, I believe, sometimes destroyed some of their own stuff, if not the Japanese. So experiences vary, but again, generally, I believe it's uh, quite difficult for people, Japanese Americans, to uh, get copies on their own.
So what can you do? Uh, see if you can get, if you have any contacts in Japan, uh, see if they could help. Um, we have the Mormon Family History Center in Tokyo. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Mormon church, they are um, very focused on helping their membership uh, do genealogy because that's part of their faith. So they've built these family history centers throughout the world uh, which help members uh, research their family tree. So, uh, you know, there probably aren't that many Mormons in Japan, but they, they do apparently have an office. And uh, I've actually corresponded with them uh, many years ago asking, you know, what sort of help they could provide uh, because someone familiar with my class told me that he had contacted them to get his wife's uh, uh, Koseki and Joseki. Uh, he was a uh, American Caucasian. He had a Japanese wife and for whatever reason his wife uh, didn't want to uh, get the records herself. So uh, he, he knew about this procedure about requesting the Koseki, but he asked uh, this uh, family history center in Tokyo to help him out, in which they did. Uh, they did it on his behalf. So um, they probably don't do that quite, you know, very often. You know, that was kind of an unusual request, but I did uh, email the person at the time. Uh, they may have changed, uh, but this is the email that I that I looked up, you know, who's currently uh, available there. So uh, they apparently do not have any records that they could share. Apparently the government has put restrictions on a lot of records, you know, other, you know, uh, records, not the Koseki, but other records that may be there uh, that are unavailable. Uh, we have a question. Yeah. What's the difference between Koseki and Joseki? Uh, the Joseki is the archived Koseki, which has uh, all the deceased members. So everyone who's uh, been removed, you know, that has an X through their name uh, completely, uh, then it gets archived. The Koseki is just the current uh, active uh, family registry, which has you know everyone who is currently living uh, in that family. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another source. If you had uh, ancestors that immigrated to Hawaii, uh, the Consulate General of Japan apparently uh, offers some assistance. And I I don't have any personal experience with this. Uh, uh, but it, it's something that I've, I've read about. So uh, you can explore that yourself if you have uh, Hawaiian uh, ancestors. So other sources of information. So I mentioned in uh, last week in my first uh, travel log about the Kakocho. So again, this is a, a Buddhist document uh, kept in the Buddhist temples. Uh, it's uh, translated as Book of the Past. So uh, again, it's to uh, honor your ancestors. It has all the names of the uh, ancestors who have passed. So again, this is a good, uh, substitute for the Koseki if you can find it. So uh, again, you have to find the Buddhist temple that would have it and uh, whether they still have the documents going back 
that many years. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I was lucky in that uh, on my mother's side, they did have the uh, Kakocho, which went back 400 years. Okay. This is the picture of it. So, uh, so again, the difficulty is, you know, you won't be able to find this on Google. I doubt that people are digitizing these records, although you know, maybe someone has, but uh, usually, again, these are sensitive information and that uh, other, uh, you know, people don't want it shared, you know, with the public. And uh, you know the the reading of the kanji is uh, also an issue. Uh, here's some other sources. Again, uh, you would have to actually be in Japan to to locate these things. So. Uh, the registry, there's this uh, resident registration. Uh, again, that may be covered by some privacy. So this is uh, more of a uh, current thing. I don't know whether they maintain the, uh, the older ones. Uh, the, the mortuary tablets, you know, these uh, sticks that, are, that I'm showing here and uh, gravestone inscriptions. So uh, again, you would, uh, you would need to know where your family's uh, gravestones are located. You know, they, they may not have a private uh, cemetery like, like, uh, like my mother's family here. Uh, you know, they, they may be in some public cemetery, but again, there's information that will help you with uh, uh, your family tree information. So let's see, that's, that's all I had for this section before I go on to names. So are there any questions? Uh, no questions. Okay, so, uh, so the family name or Miyoji, so this is a Noren or curtain that I had made. So you, know, you see the Hashizume kanji and my uh, family crest there. So uh, Japanese family names or surnames, they're inherently linked to the origin and history of your family and reflects the customs and norms of Japanese society. So until the 1870s, over 80% of the Japanese did not have a family name. You know, that's quite surprising, you know, because again, 1870s, not that long ago. So prior to that, uh, having a family name, it was more of a symbol of your status, privilege, or power. So for the most part, you know, only the uh, upper parts of society, you know, the nobility and the samurai uh, had family names or were allowed to have family names. So people at the bottom of the uh, society were banned from using family names because it, it carried a connotation that you were someone important or powerful. And then as most of our ancestors were uh, from these small towns and villages and probably were not part of the upper part of society for the most part, uh, they probably didn't have family names until recently. So here's a, uh, uh, yeah. Someone was just asking, uh, where did you get the Noren made? I think they're talking about the curtain. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll have to look it up. There's some uh, place in the Bay Area that, that I had it made. 
and this was uh, quite a long time ago, so I'm not sure they're still still around. But I'll I'll look it up. Okay. Uh, so this is a diagram of the uh, Japanese society in feudal Japan. So you know you have at the top the emperor, um, then the uh, shoguns and the daimyos. The next level. Then the samurai, as I mentioned, you know, they were held in high regard. Uh, and then you have the peasants and artisans, which is the majority of the people. And then you had the merchants at the bottom. Uh, this was actually surprising to me why the merchants were at the bottom. You know, a, you would think that the peasants would be at the bottom. Uh, apparently it's because they, since they produced nothing of their own, all they did was some, sell someone else's stuff. Uh, that's why they were considered lowest class. But I found that interesting. Uh, so anyway, only the generally only the people you know in the top three layers, maybe some of the fourth layer, may you know probably had um, family names or surnames. So prior to the 1870s, though, you know, I, of the people that did have uh, family names, you know, there were different types of family names. So I'm listing all, all the different types or the different types of names. You know, they could include uh, personal names or what, what Westerners refer to as first names. So again, it was all kind of uh, structure based on you know who you were and uh, actually uh, many people were assigned names based on their role in other words uh, if you were part of the lower class and you worked for pull this diagram here So if you worked for, you know, like one of these daimyo, the landowner, uh, you were probably one of these people in the uh, fourth level. So, but, you know, if you were like given a specific role, like you were the gardener, you might be given that name, which referred to you as the gardener, rather than as a personal identification. So that's how uh, names were, again, how names were generally viewed, more of your role and position rather than uh, identify an individual person. So the, the bushi or the warrior class, uh, now they, they could have many names. Uh, as you can see, it seems like they were obsessed with, with names. And then the actual structure um, hasn't really uh, changed too much. You know, they, you know, because the family was considered primary importance, that's why uh, the family name is always uh, mentioned first. And, you know, that's even in modern times, you know, that carried over, you know, in Asia. Uh, you always have family name first and then your personal name. So that's why I don't refer to it as last name, first name, because that, that's solely in Western society. Last name is the family name for us. So it's, they used to say family name, no personal name. In other words, uh, someone of the uh, Minamoto, you know, which was a clan, and then later the no was dropped. So it just became family name followed by personal name. And then generally uh, Japanese do not have middle names. Although that's probably has changed in um, modern Japan, you know, as, as they adopt more Western uh, culture. All right, so since the vast majority did not have family names, uh, they had to select one when the Koseki law was passed. So 
the Kosaki law was passed in 1871. So after it was passed, it required, uh, like I said, every member of the family to be registered by family. But if you didn't have a family name, how would you register? So th that, that's why uh, a large part of the population had to actually choose a family name uh, as a result of the Koseki law. Because they had to decide, okay, what, what is our family name that we put in the Koseki? So, uh, so I list all these different ways in which people actually chose a family name. So, you know, like uh, the estate name, that's how my uh, mother's family initially chose their name, as I mentioned. They, they chose it based on the estate that uh, they lived at. Uh, then you have uh, town and village names, because again, there were 70,000 towns and villages, uh, people decided, oh, I live in uh, this town, so why don't we call ourselves uh, this name? And uh, then you have, you know, a lot of geographical area names. You know, as I mentioned, there were a lot of provinces, but there could be some local geographies that people would just take on. Uh, field names referring to the rice fields. Uh, that's actually how the family name or Myoji came about because a lot of people adopted names based on uh, rice fields and I'll, I'll give you examples. Uh, elements of nature, uh, traditional or prestigious names. And again, because only the uh, upper class in society had family names, uh, people that wanted to become associated with them would say, oh, why don't we adopt the um, Minamoto clan name because, you know, they're considered very prestigious or some other famous samurai. Uh, family names of distant uh, relatives who are, again, a higher class, again, based on the notion of, okay, I want to be associated with this uh, higher class, so you know, I'll take on this family name. Uh, occupations, you know, like uh, fishermen or uh, weaver, uh, guilds, you know, which are merchant um, uh, associations, and uh, then uh, selection by your your Buddhist priest. So you know, the Buddhist priest may think, okay, this this name is. Uh, somehow you know is you know has better fortune for you or you know i'm i'm you know consider it you know this is this is in your uh, future so they'll select that name so uh more than 80 percent were derived from uh, place names or nature so because of this way of how the Japanese chose their family names. This uh, could explain, and you know, again, I haven't, uh, I'm not citing any particular academic studies. This is just based on my own uh, understanding of how things occurred, uh, why there's a higher occurrence of unrelated families with the same name in the same area. So uh, for example, maybe there were several families who decided to choose the name of their village, even though they weren't related. So some people may think, well, we must be related because we lived in the same village and you know, our ancestors had the same family name. Well, it's because they chose it because they lived in that village. And uh, yeah, they may very well be related, but uh, again, because of how they actually chose it, you know, that will determine whether they were related or not. So uh, an example was, you know, I had someone in my class who, you know, their family name was Miyagishima and uh, 
you know, they had this uh, booklet that they created and uh, they claimed that uh, all the Miyagishimas in the United States were related to them and that all the uh, Miyagishimas, you know, and that they also came from the town of Miyagishima. So right away I thought, well, okay, is that just a coincidence or did they choose, choose that? So anyway, they claimed, well, everyone, you know, they know that all these families, you know, who are named Miyagishima and who came from Miyagishima were related because of that fact. So I sort of question that, but, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but again, this may be the reason. And then unrelated families with the same name in different areas. So, uh, such as Yamada. So that means mountain rice field. So why is that such a common name? It's not because they're related, it's because probably because a lot of Japanese families decided, oh, I work in a rice field, you know, I'm near a mountain, so we'll call ourselves the Yamadas. So uh, that's another uh, observation again. So another thing that I, you know, so, this sort of got me interested in, in researching more about names in particular. So I found out that Japan has the largest number of different family names of any country. So uh, I'm excluding the US you know, because you know, we're uh, you know, a diverse uh, country you know, with many different uh, nationalities and ethnic origins. So you know, countries that have one ethnic origin, uh, Japan, uh, has the largest number. So, you know, that's an interesting uh, phenomenon. So if you say that your, your name is rare, you know, that's why I was referring to that, uh, you know, even though Hashizume, you know, is only the 1200th most common name, you can view it in two different ways. You know, is it really that common or because there's over 100,000, yeah. So just as a comparison, you know, because you know, this is just some anecdotal information that I found. So China has approximately 3,000 different family names, you know, far less. And then Korea only has, you know, less than 300. Uh, so interesting enough, uh, people probably could guess that the most common family name in Korea is Kim. So I was reading that 20% uh, of the population in Korea has the family name Kim. Now, I would guess that they're not all related. And uh, you know, I'd be interested to see how Korea came up with their family names, because as you can see, there's quite a, a difference as to how Japan came up with their family names, you know, in terms of the uh, uh, variety. All right, so the other thing to note is that uh, not to focus specifically on your family name because uh, generally only two ancestors in your generation will have the same family name as you, you know, your parents. So, and then, uh, you know, for each generation and then, then on your father's side would be his parents and then et cetera. So, you know, you're gonna have thousands and millions of other different family names other than your own that are in your family tree. So, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning that uh, Kuramoto is in my family tree. Well, that's because that's who the original uh, founder, so to speak, of the Hashizume family, my Hashizume family, what their uh, original family name was. So, you know, and, and then Minami as well, because, you know, Minami was the wife. So I have Kuramoto's and Minami's in, in my family tree. And then, you know, everyone may have these uh, Yoshis, you know, which you have to trace, you know, to where, where the, uh, the daughter got married. So, you know, it becomes, again, 
the, the family tree could spread out to multiple uh, family names. So what is the meaning of your name? So uh, Japanese names are usually chosen for a specific meaning uh, and determining the meaning and how it's chosen may provide additional information about your origins. Uh, names often consist of two kanji characters, sometimes three, sometimes uh, you know, other, but uh, uh, one and four are rare. And then the single character names are often derived from Chinese. So yeah, I mentioned about Yamada. Uh, the first character is uh, Yama or mountain, and the second character is is da or rice field, so that means mountain rice field. So that's that's one that's fairly simple. Uh, Tanaka, another one. Uh, so I'm showing how the the different uh, kanji characters are used in the name. So you see the same symbol for uh, rice field on the on Yamada is now the first character for Tanaka because. Uh, again, even though it's pronounced Tanaka, not Danaka, uh, it's, it still means rice field, Naka meaning in the middle, so it means in the middle of the rice field. So 30 of the 100 most common family names in Japan uh, contain either the Yama or the rice field Da or Ta uh, character. So uh, in your reference section, you know, the separate document, I put uh, the most common uh, uh, family name character. So uh, I, I didn't put the kanji. Uh, I put the uh, romanized version, like you know, I'll put yama and da. So uh, essentially it sort of becomes like a menu. You could see how a lot of names were formed, you know, they would take one character, put it together with another character, and you know, came up with these combinations. You know, sort of like uh, you know, pick one from column A, one from column B, and that's what you get. So here are the uh, common names using the uh, rice field or mountain characters. So you can see how you know, sort of like a uh, a series. So you understand, okay, all these da or ta names refer to the rice field and all the yama names refer to mountains. And then uh, again, my contention is that because these were common, uh, simple uh, combinations, that's why you'll see a lot of people with these same family names, but they're not related. It's because their ancestors happened to pick, you know, this combination because, you know, it sounded good. You know, I, I don't know why people would pick purple rice field. Maybe they're growing purple rice, but, uh, you know, that, that would be my uh, theory of, of why uh, some of these names are, are fairly common and, but they're, you know, they're not of related people. So here are the 10 most common family names in Japan. So I wanted to point out uh, uh, the first one, Sato. So the second character, kanji character here is actually the Fuji character. And the reason for that is because this name was derived from the Fujiwara clan. And uh, you know, I mentioned about these branch families when uh, you know, the Fujiwara eldest son you know, took over the Fujiwara family, but then there are probably other sons. So they wanted to start their own family lines. So this, son probably uh, you know went to Tochiji and so 
they came up with this name, so they wanted to preserve the you know origin of his family, which is the Fuji. They took the Fuji part and then they combined it with this Sano. So uh, so what this means, the the uh, meaning of Sato is really San, uh, Fujiwara of Sano, which is where uh, apparently the uh, original Sato family uh, was from. However, why is it the most common family name? Because the Fujiwaras, you know, were a well-known clan, they became famous, and then apparently my guess is that when people wanted to choose uh, their family name, they chose this Sato because it was, a, uh, again, they uh, derived from a prestigious clan. And so people wanted to come associated with the Satos. So, and then you also see likewise with Ito and Kato. These are also derived from the Fujiwara clan. You see the Fuji character, you know, as the second character. So you have three of the top 10 most common family names in Japan derived from the Fujiwara clan, you know, even though you don't see Fujiwara anymore. And so I was reading uh, somewhere that 30% uh, of the population of Japan uh, are related to the Satos, or at least claim to be related, or something like that. But I, I, I sort of doubt that, again, because of this, you know, derivation of, uh, you know, where these names came from. Uh, and then you see some of the other common names. And again, the reason why they were common is because these were uh, probably easy combinations that people came up with, or, you know, they were you know, maybe famous by someone, and they just chose it. And uh, you could look up your own Japanese uh, name in some of these uh, uh, websites that I have. Uh, but the thing is, uh, because of it's based on the kanji spelling. And I'll get into that. So, um, Chester? Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt, but we're at 11.34 now, so do you think this would be a good place to stop for today? Uh, yes, sorry, I sort of lost track of time. Uh, if there's any, if there's not too many questions, I can answer a couple questions. Uh, no questions, but I have a quick one. I just wanted to know because I know my common and I know uh, like the name of it. So do you have any books or maybe like an online encyclopedia that you could recommend? Because I don't know like the history of my family crest. So is that something I could find online or is that something that I would have to like contact my relatives in Japan for? Uh, yeah, there's things online uh, for uh, family crests because the designs themselves are fairly common. So, uh, so you could probably uh, find that crest design and see what's, you know, the historical uh, description of that. And I also have some books which are listed in, in my presentation at the end. Okay, great, thank you. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I looked up uh, the Japanese names of people registered for this class. Uh, and, you know, I found some stuff on the internet, so I'll e email those to those people, and you know, they can look it up themselves in the, on the website. But you know, I, I captured it already, so it gives information like the meaning of the name, the ranking, etc. Uh, and I 
was going to do that before this class, but I didn't know whether I would get this far. And then if other people who do not have a Japanese family name in their own name, but they want to uh, have me look it up, uh, you can just send it to me. And then, you know, I'll, I'll look it up and, and send you what, what I found on the, uh, on the internet. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll conclude this week. And uh, again, if anyone has any questions uh, in the meantime, uh, feel free to email me and uh, you know, we'll meet again next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.